I started this channel and within around 24 days, I had broken a thousand subscribers. I just got monetized on it. It just happened and it's pretty awesome. Meet Chris Miles, a side hustler who blew up in one of YouTube's most competitive niches. So how did he go from zero to 1000 subscribers in 24 days? Let's imagine for a second that this channel you've started off gets deleted, disappears. What's the roadmap you would follow like step by step to sort of create a new channel and get back on top? Yeah, that's an excellent question. I guess the main thing that I would do is choose a topic that I like. That's one of the things you always have to worry about because when you're trying to pick a niche or a niche, depending on where you are in the world, because of the amount of effort you're going to be putting into it, you want to be sure that it's going to work. I think the main thing I look for is the monetization aspect of it, how I'm going to make money with it. So just to give you an example, I've saw other people in the niche who were making money that was outside of the YouTube partner program. They were creating like resume templates. They were creating videos on how to grow on YouTube. They were creating how to be successful with side hustle type content and they're being successful with it. So I was like, okay, there's an audience of people who are there that want to buy this thing and I can monetize it whether or not YouTube ads gives me money or not. If niche doesn't have those aspects to it, then I might stay away from it. So one thing that you can do is just look around and see if there's competition. A lot of times people are afraid afraid of competition. You shouldn't be afraid of competition because that shows that there is traffic there that can be had. You just got to find a way to give a unique take that's exclusive just to you. Make money online, health or relationships. Those are just going to be some of the biggest niches that you can get in because almost every human on the planet has an issue with one of those things. Is it ever such a thing as too much competition in your opinion? It depends. There's not really a hundred percent way that you're going to get it right outside of just putting some content out there and just seeing what happens. My goal with this channel was to get 20, 30 videos out there and just see what what happened. Thankfully, within about nine to 10 videos, I had a thousand subscribers. So to me, that's proving the concept and I'm going to end up pouring more time and effort into it. After doing those things, what would you say is like the next step on your roadmap from zero to a thousand subs in 24 days? I think what's huge as well is being able to infuse story into what I was doing with a video. I'm going to be honest, I struggled with it for a long time because I couldn't figure out how to infuse story into what I was doing with some of the videos because it was very kind of direct and to the point type information. But but information is a commodity, right? You can go anywhere and get information. What makes information unique is by infusing some type of story within it. I read this book called Story Worthy by Matthew Dick. He mentions in there that you need to sit down almost every single day and just write down what happened in your day so that you can always have a catalog of stories that you can bring back in a particular situation. So I just have this nice long library. And sometimes if I'm in the middle of the day and I remember this story about what happened to me 10 years ago that I haven't thought of since then, I'll be sure to go write it down because I might be able to use it later in a video if I need to try to discuss or prove a point. One thing that I do in a lot of the videos is I'm explaining different types of side hustles. So very rarely do I have like one linear kind of overarching story on the whole thing. I normally just, if I'm doing seven of the best side hustles, I might have seven mini stories. That's really helpful in getting the retention. So I'm sure you've all seen those videos where they say these are the craziest shots in basketball, but they get increasingly crazier or something like that. And usually what you can do is when you're creating your content, I don't just pick seven random side hustles and then just put them anywhere in a video. I'll try to put some type of line in between all of them to where these are the ones that you're going to make a little bit of money with, but then the ones here, you're going to make a lot of money with. So by breaking it up, I'm kind of creating the different acts, I guess you can say, within the video where things are the introduction and then the setup and then the actual climax and resolution. But before we go to our next point, obviously getting monetized is a lot of work. So let's quickly go over why it's worth getting monetized in the first place. Firstly, when monetized, you can start earning money through ads. On average, you'll earn about $6 per thousand views according to a study I did. You can also turn on channel memberships, which is kind of like Patreon where your fans can subscribe and pay you a monthly fee. You can turn on super thanks, chat and stickers where people can give you one-off donations in live streams and comment sections. And last but not least, you can link a store where you can sell merch. And speaking of merch, I need to thank today's sponsor, Dot Store Domains. When it comes to branding their stores, most creators settle for gross URLs that are longer than Endgame and confuse their viewers. And so now creators like Mr. Beast, Dude Perfect, Zach King, or even me use Dot Store Domains. Aside from being clear and telling the world that you're selling something on this website, websites with a dot store domain see up to 2x more search visibility and up to 87% more traffic. A short intuitive dot store URL is easy for fans to remember. So get your dot store domain today for just 99 cents for your first year using my link and code below. 
So build a better brand, sell more, and join some cool creators with a dot store domain. Now back to Mr. Miles's next point. Step one, you mentioned picking a niche. Step two, you were looking at the stories that you have and what stories you can tell in your content that will make it unique from everyone else. Is that right so far? That and the scripting is, is a big deal for me. Usually that's coming up with the story ideas. A lot of people I've seen on YouTube and they'll say, oh yeah, just write you a quick outline and then just shoot off the hip. I don't necessarily write my scripts word for word. They're kind of wordy, but mainly I'm just trying to get the idea. But the scripting is a big deal because I can actually sit down and try to figure out, okay, what kind of story could I use to humanize this particular element of my video so that I can keep people watching longer? I would probably say the scripting part is probably has been helpful the most for me because it does make shooting the videos easier. Before, if I had just two short bullet points, I might end up having to say it 10 times before I actually have the correct inflection in my voice that I want for the final cut. However, when I scripted, I already know what I want to say. I can actually record faster. So instead of recording taking me 90 minutes to do and then I got to cut all of that down to 11 minute video. If I put more time into the scripting, it saves everywhere else down the line. And it actually helps out too in terms of getting the views because you can be more intentional in what you're saying. I actually lay down, I can't remember everything. I'm terrible at it. Just ask my wife. But I have what I call a scripting workflow that I follow. And it's basically research, subtopics, which is like maybe the headlines, the main beats of the video I want to follow or that I want to create. And then I create an initial rough draft. And then I'll do what I call a script cleanup where I'm making sure stuff makes sense grammatically and I try to trim maybe written fluff. And then I'll go back and do it again with what I call retention hooks. We kind of briefly talked about it earlier where I'm going through and trying to add more open loops as many as I can within the video to try to get people to continue watching just that portion. And then sometimes I'll come up with like a sneaky way to say hit the like button or something. I don't always include that in videos, but if I find a good spot for it, I might throw it in. And then if I have any call to actions in the video, so I have a newsletter called Your Extra Paycheck. So if I have someone going into the video, then I can say, where do I want to stick that call to action? So I would do that, make sure that the rest of the video is good. And then at the very end of the video, I would then tell people, hey, go watch this video and have a nice little transition there. And then I have a final look over and then it's ready to shoot. That would probably be the workflow that I follow within the scripting. And that way I remember to hit every aspect of that versus trying to all remember it from my head. One statistic I'm always trying to get higher is the views per viewer. So if a views per viewer on a particular video is only one, I want to get that to one and a half if I can. That means everyone who finds this video ends up watching a second video. And YouTube loves that because if YouTube can see that your video is keeping people on YouTube longer and beyond one video, then they're going to suggest your stuff more often. One of the challenges people might have, even if you get really good at storytelling, if people never click on the video and never even get it served to them on YouTube, then it doesn't matter how great your stories are, no one's going to hear them. How did you overcome that problem? Definitely the idea and then the thumbnail and title. So one thing that I I've done and I got this idea from you and some others is not to necessarily take topics and ideas from people that are already in my niche because you know, a copy of a copy rarely is going to be good. Sometimes you can have some success with it or you might even have marginal success with it. But one thing that I found is to go to more broader niches that are a little bit higher in terms of maybe maturity. Let's just say I was starting a golf channel. I might go look at a football channel or something like that that's a little bit maybe bigger than the golf niche and then seeing what they're doing that's being successful and then just bring that idea over from that niche to my more smaller niche. And by doing that, usually you're bringing a fresh idea to an audience that doesn't know about it, but the idea is already proven because it's gone viral in a much bigger, more mature niche. You want to have a nice, simple thumbnail. They all can't be Mr. Beast thumbnails, but you want it to be able to stop the scroll long enough so that people will actually read the title. In my particular niche, in this niche right here with Side Hustles, essentially at the end of the day, at its most empirical form, Marcus, people just want to make money and they want to make a lot of it really fast. And that's not always realistic, but usually this is just a good marketing principle is you want to sell what everybody needs, but package it in what they want. And by doing that, it's very helpful because when creating the thumbnails, I can see what typically works in a thumbnail. And then I try to replicate that as often as possible. So in my niche, a lot of people always put the amount of money that they're going to make in the top left hand part of the thumbnail. And that's just usually where it is. And usually it's in green or it's in gold or whatever color actually really pops. So that element, I try to make sure I include that in my thumbnails because I know that my audience responds to it. At that point, I just have to be creative as to how I'm going to include the number in the thumbnail. I like to also include my face in a thumbnail somehow. I don't do it 100% of the time, but probably 99% of the time. That's just mainly for branding so that people can say, oh, it's another video from Chris or whatever. As you kind of build that brand and then you start getting that recognizability to the people within your niche, that's really helpful. One element that I've been doing really
really taken a lot of time to figure out as well is contrasting colors. I would pull up, like I have a YouTube channel that I purposely only watch videos that are in my niche on that channel so that when I look at the browse on the front page, I'm only seeing videos from other people within my niche. And by doing that, sometimes I looked and saw that, you know, a lot of these thumbnails are dull looking. They don't pop at all. So one thing I've decided to do in my niche is try to be a little bit more intentional with the colors that I'm choosing within the thumbnail. But one thing that I did specifically, I took a whole bunch of pictures of myself with a gray t-shirt on so that I can, within Photoshop, be able to change the color of my t-shirt pretty easily or whatever I want it to be. It's harder to do with a dark colored shirt versus a white shirt, but I found that with a gray shirt, it's perfect. I can make it black or blue or green or orange or whatever I want. The hack I've been using too, Marcus, is I have the beta version of Photoshop, which allows you to use their AI to do stuff. So I usually keep my face the same. I don't really touch it, but outline myself, everything from the neck down and tell the AI to generate a blue shirt or something like that. And if it comes out and it looks nice, I might end up using it in the thumbnail. So I've been able to kind of repurpose the same picture of me about 10 or 15 different times, but I have a different shirt on each time. So it makes it look like it's a different picture of me or a different thumbnail. And this is just me, but I feel like people see the thumbnail and then they read the title and the title instantly tells them, oh, I got to watch this. In fact, Mr. V said in the video, you want a title that's so good. Like you want them to be festering the rest of the day because they didn't click on your title. When it comes to a title, I will write maybe the first iteration of that title. And then I will sit there and rewrite it probably 30 or 40 times, just trying to come up with different iterations and then eventually just pick one and go with it. So I spend a ridiculous amount of time of coming up with the idea, the thumbnail, and then the title, and then the intro to the video as well. And then I probably spend just as much time on those aspects than I do the rest of the video. So by focusing on the packaging, I think it's more helpful to get you more views faster. How do you know when you've found something good? Like you mentioned, you write out 30 or 40 tiles and then choose one. How do you know which one to choose? So when I'm doing the title, I will come up with a few of them and then I would just change like one iteration of it. For example, I have one title that's called seven high paying remote jobs that are hiring immediately. But the first iteration of that might have been seven remote jobs that are hiring right now or need a job, seven remote jobs that are hiring now or something like that. So I would just sit there and just try to come up with 30 or 40 variations of it. And then I would stop looking at it. Then maybe the next day I then revisit it kind of with a fresh mind, start coming up with a few more ideas. And then from there, I'm trying to come up with the fewest amount of words that gets the point across because I want people to glance and be like, oh, I got to watch this because I try to have my titles maybe not have any more than seven to 14 words or whatever it happens to be. I don't want it to be very long at all. Just something that is a quick yada, yada, yada. Oh yeah, I, I better watch that. What would you say comes after that? Are there like follow up or next steps that you would need to follow in order to continue blowing up a brand new channel from scratch? Yeah, I would say the videos need to be good. I think a lot of what we're talking about is assuming the video is good. You have to learn how to make good content, basically. Like I mentioned before, I probably spend an inordinate amount of time on coming up with the idea, thumbnail and title and the hook and intro for a video. But the rest of the video still needs to be helpful. It still needs to be good. That's where the storytelling kind of comes in. I would say if you want to look at it the way that YouTube looks at it, I believe it's good content is satisfying content. Nine times out of 10, you've probably watched a YouTube video. And then after you maybe came back to the browse screen and it asked you, what did you think of this suggestion? Did you like it? What about it did you like? Where they're just trying to figure out, were you satisfied by watching this video? I've probably seen every Mr. Beast or Jimmy Donaldson's interview that he's ever done on YouTube talking about YouTube. Same thing with like Patty Galloway. I watch all of your videos. You know, I'm just always trying to figure out what these guys are thinking. When they see something, how do they know that this is going to work? And I think Patty Galloway actually said something really interesting. As good as he is, he still gets stuff wrong, right? So it's not necessarily you're going to be this YouTube god where everything you touch is going to turn into gold. Some of your videos are going to flop. You know, some of them aren't going to do well. I have videos on my channel right now that don't have more than 120 views. And that's a video I probably spent eight hours making, <laughs> you know, so some people that's defeating and understandably so. But when you see the potential of what you can really do, if a YouTube channel really takes off and not just in terms of views and subscribers, but I mean revenue, right? If you see how much time you're putting into it now and what it can become, if you were to get it right, it makes the one video that's not doing well, or maybe the handful of videos that's not doing well, all worth it from what you learned from that experience so that you don't do it again. And then you can try to do better at it and try to get better and try to get better. So I guess to answer your question is just watch what a lot of these really good YouTubers are doing. Stay on kind of the cutting edge of what's working right now on YouTube and trying your best to replicate that for your audience.
I really liked how you said like observe yourself, like observe what videos you're clicking on because that's sort of a reflection of what is good because there's probably a lot of good content around, but you don't click on every single video. So when you click on a video, like ask yourself the question, like why did I click on that video and try and psychoanalyze yourself after you've done it. So allow yourself to take that action. And once you've taken that action, take a step back and be like, hang on a sec, why did I actually click on this video over the hundred other videos I just scrolled through? And then eventually you'll identify patterns. And if you can create content that you would click on above hundreds of other videos on your homepage, then chances are other people would also click on that as well. You know, one thing that me and my son do often is we'll just sit down and watch the newest Mr. Beast video. And sometimes while the video's going on, I'm looking at him and I'm trying to see, did his eyes wander? Did he start, you know, playing on his tablet? Or is he actually stuck watching the video the entire time? And then I look at Jimmy and see, okay, what was he doing that kept even a seven-year-old continuing to watch his videos? Small things like that, you kind of internalize it in your head. You might not even be thinking about it when you're scripting or shooting the video but since it's there you might subconsciously include it and just get better at it just because you put it in your head to begin with are there any like massive mistakes that you think small creators are making that are really preventing them from achieving results like anything come to mind yeah interestingly enough as much as we've been talking about putting so much time into the idea and the title and the thumbnail and the hook and the intro and all of these things one of the biggest issues i see is people just overthinking it <laughs> i know that sounds very very oxymoronic, but if you overthink it too much, you're gonna talk yourself into not doing it. And that's what I want to try to get people to prevent themselves from doing. Go out there and just do it. You're not going to be really good at every aspect of YouTube. There's a million things that need to happen in order. And when you're starting a YouTube channel, you're on number four. So you can't expect yourself to be really good at everything at the exact same time. Your videos are probably gonna suck early on, especially if you haven't created videos ever before. So I would say create the video. And when you get to that 50th video, you're gonna look at that first video and be like, man, I was trash. That was garbage. I can't believe I did that. Why did I put that out on the internet? You know, I think Ali Abdal had an interesting statement. He said, first, you want to make a video every week. Now you want to make a good video every week. That's basically the steps you want to kind of go through. It really just depends on how you think in your head, what's going to stop you from not doing it. Are you going to come up with a whole bunch of excuses and never get started? Or are you going to actually get out there and not care what anyone else thinks and just do it? Just to clarify for people, because like you said, we have talked about putting a lot of effort and time into thumbnails and tiles and etc practically looking at like your day how do you balance taking action but then also putting in time i try to block out time to work on different aspects of the production process of a video. You have the ideation, you have the scripting, you have all these things. And what I do is I just plug in, I put on the headphones and, you know, I'm going to do this for an hour. Growing up in high school and college and everything, I was really the greatest procrastinator on the planet. I was a professional procrastinator, but I always turned in everything on time, even if it meant me having to cram the night before or write a 10 page term paper. I stay up all night to write it and uh, actually turn it in on time or something like that. But the reason that happened was because I had a set time period that it needed to to be done and I did it in that time period. Was it always great? I don't know if it was always amazing, but you know, I had decent grades, so I think I did all right. <laughs> but regardless, you are time blocking, but you're putting a time frame on completing a task. And if you don't put a time frame on completing that task, it's going to end up taking as long a time as you want it to be. So if I give myself eight hours to write a script, it's probably going to take me eight hours to write that script. But if I set myself down and say, hey, I need to do this in two hours, I'm probably going to do it in two hours because I've set a time frame for when I need it to be completed. You're right in that if you set a deadline, usually the human psyche is that we'll stick to it. But also if you set a deadline to write a script in 10 minutes versus like eight hours, the eight hour one's probably gonna be better even if you get them both done. For you, when you're creating your content, what do you block out time for and how much time do you block out for each of those things? Yeah, I probably block out time for the scripting mainly because the punch out of 12 to 15 minute video, scripting might take me about two hours maybe and it depends on how much research i have to do and how much effort i have to put into it in terms of coming up with a good story idea for that particular aspect of the video and then i have some scripts that i'll start writing and then i'll kind of hit a blocking point or something i'll stop working on it and then i'll go start another script which is probably terribly toxic but i, I do that sometimes and then i'll end up finishing that second script a lot faster and then maybe that's the video i got to put out there and i'll go ahead with it but then i'll just go back and finish that script at some point and once the script's finally done 
then I can go ahead and shoot it and then get it done. Is there an amount of time that you block out for coming out with titles or thumbnails? Because like you mentioned that you do kind of go through a bunch of iterations with those and like it is possible to create 300 different titles and still not be 100% happy with any of them. So like how do you balance putting an effort there but then also not taking too much time yeah that one's hard to do because i'm probably always looking at titles even if i'm just kind of watching youtube leisurely and i have the notion app on my phone i have just this insanely long titles there might be three four hundred titles there and anytime i come across a decent title i'm like oh that actually might work in my niche right then and there i stop myself and i write it down in the notion template or whatever you call it i mean if i had to sit down and just do it and give myself a time frame on it i probably wouldn't do it any longer than 30 to 45 minutes the last thing i wanted to ask you about so obviously you signed up for my four digit challenge again i'm not paying you to say anything here or whatever but i'd be genuinely curious like what are your honest impressions and thoughts of it yeah man so some of the hacks that you have in there i had never even thought of i love the idea of how you have it pretty step by step every single day of what you should do this day that really is helpful for someone who doesn't know what they're doing i had a little bit of an idea before i got started with this i mean i'm by no means an expert but man some of the hacks and tips that you have within the course I, we talked about one of them earlier but just doing that making days thing made the entire purchase worth it so i'm gonna be honest i started creating the videos on the channel before i even finished your course as soon as i bought it and started going through it. So I would say it's a good course. If you have been on the fence and you want to go ahead and give it a try, go ahead because you're going to know exactly what to do in a very defined time period. And the chances of you succeeding with it are a lot higher than if you were to try to do it all on your own, trying to piece together everything that's on YouTube. You'd probably want to do both, to be honest, because I mean, I follow you and I follow a whole bunch of other people as well, but I bought your course. The things you talked about, I resonated with you a little bit more with. And I was like, you know what, let me go ahead and give this a try. And when I first got it, I was like, oh, is this just for gamers? But after a while, I started looking at and I was like, oh, this works for any niche and started putting together the tactics and the tricks from there. And it worked. Like I mentioned, I started doing this and I got a thousand subs within about three and a half weeks, barely that much. And to that, I'm grateful because now I'm looking at this channel to blow up. I really wanted to grow big. Thanks. I'm really glad and honored to have been a little part of your journey there. Well, man, anything you want to leave the audience with before we wrap up? One of my favorite sayings actually is, and I try to do this myself, is to fear, regret more than you fear failure. That way you don't want to be 10, 15 years from now oh i missed a boat on youtube or i missed a boat on whatever you know you might be doing in your life give it a try give it a good honest try don't just do one video and give up get 10 15 20 videos out there if you're really feeling it get 50 to 100 videos out there before you make a decision to stop doing it and if you do that it's guaranteed to change your life guaranteed you just have to get out there and actually do it so get started that'll probably be the thing that i would leave for it with everyone love that man thanks so much for sharing everything